Good morning, everyone. You're welcome to this uh, ultra fast photochemistry session. So, today we have three talks given by Majed Chirgui, Matthew Wingart, and Nadia Klik. We have a little technical problem with the presentation, so we will actually start uh, with Nadia Doslik, and she will be talking about uh, strategies for modeling and monitoring photochemical processes, progress, and challenges. So, please, Nadia, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you. Um... Hello, do you see my slide? Okay. Hello, um, good morning. Um, uh, yes, we have this small uh, difference in the schedule, but uh, let me first thank the organizer uh, for the organizer for inviting me to give this uh, presentation on what we do in Zagreb on modeling and monitoring photochemical processes. The figure that you see on the screen is actually the picture is not from Zagreb, but from uh, from Mostar, where I'm currently visiting. This is in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. So what we uh, what I'm going to speak about today is modeling and monitoring of photochemical reaction. We start with uh, assigning the spectra UV absorption spectra in the um, of nucleobases of any or any other complex molecule in terms of diabetic uh, in terms of uh, diabetic electronic states, and then uh, what we do is. Uh, and the second part of the talk is to compare different dynamics approaches to excited state dynamics, uh, comparing quantum and semi-classical surface hopping algorithms. And on top of this, what I would like, the, what is the center focus of this talk is the computation of ultra-fast spectroscopy signals. Uh, specifically, I'm going to compute to show you how to compute the transient absorption pump probe signal and the uh, time resolved photoelectron spectroscopy signal. And the challenges will be on the way. Uh, okay, we start here with the um, UV spectra of DNA bases in water you can see that all four bases absorb in the range between uh, 290 and 210 uh, nanometers. Um, all but guanine in this range have a single very broad peak, while guanine has two, um, two peaks. But as you can also see, there is um, guanine, um, the spectrum of guanine is uh, quite difficult because the molecule is not soluble in water and the shape of the spectrum depends on the on the time uh, uh, when it is taken how much how old or how how fresh the solution the suspension of guanine in water is now what what we do um, based on classic uh, in a semi classical way to compute the spectrum, one selects the initial geometries uh, along the normal modes, individual normal modes using the Wigner distribution. This is one way. The other way is to select sample geometries from the molecular dynamics simulation. I would prefer to do the Wigner distribution sampling because I encourage you to do the Wigner distribution sampling because of the zero point energy contribution. Then once we have the geometries, we compute the vertical excitation energies and from, um, and from the um, Heller's semi-classical absorption cross section, compute the spectrum. The spectrum is given as the vertical excitation energy, the oscillator strength, and there is a broadening function here that is centered at the excitation energy. In solution, this brothering function is a Gaussian, and the width of this Gaussian is an empirical uh, parameter. In our case, it is uh, the gamma is around 0 0,11 electron volts, uh, which gives the best comparison with the experiment we got the following spectrum and the information in the spectrum. Uh, the black is the absorption spectrum of guanine, 
The orange is the computed spectrum. Um, and as you can see, we can go beyond the absorption threshold of water here in the computation, but the information we got is very unspecific. There's a number of lines that each geometry contributes with some 10 of different lines, how many um, transition there are, but then there are hundreds of geometries and the information is hidden below the specific information. What we would like to have is something else. We would like to have the transitions very well specified and different transition, and we would like to have non-empirical factors in computing the spectrum. How we do it? First, we have to compute the mean excitation energy of a transition and the mean oscillator strength for each diabatic state, for each electronic state I. And then the, the broadening function, the width of the transition is computed from the standard deviation from the mean. We start by assigning the spectrum at the reference geometry. This is usually the Frank condom geometry. Um, and we do this first by recasting the wave function of each electronic state in the base of natural transition orbitals. So this is the uh, wave function of an electronic state is given um, in terms of natural transition uh, uh, of slater de determinants that contain the NTO pairs, and these are the singular values that um, uh, uh, of for a given NTO pair. Um, a particular transition in the NTO basis is given just in terms of few NTO pairs, one, two, or maximally three NTO pairs. And, okay, the electronic states are orthogonal, but the particle and whole particle and whole NTOs are not mutually orthogonal. So by computing the overlap between partic uh, particle uh, whole and particle NTO, we can assign the spectrum at the reference geometry. I'll show you after how to do this in practice. And then once we have assigned the spectrum, when we have a spectrum assigned at the reference geometry, we connect the states of the same character at different geometries by computing the overlap between the wave functions. Okay. On, the, on the example of adenine, at the reference geometries, uh, at the reference geometry, um, adenine has 14 transition in the range between 5 and 6.5 EV. This transition uh, should be assigned. There is no other way than to look at the first natural transition orbital pair and at the particular at the whole orbital. This is an n orbital shown here, and then compute the overlap between the whole orbital and the whole orbital of all and the whole orbitals of all other transitions. And what we see is the same whole orbital participates in different transitions. We do then the same for the second orbital. This is a pi orbital. And also you can see that it contributes to different transition. And in this way, we can assign, assign all the whole orbitals in the spectrum. Then we do the same for the particle orbitals, NTO, and assign the whole spectrum in, in terms of four whole and four particle orbitals. Once we have assigned the spectrum at the reference geometry, we then connect the states of the same character shown here in with the different colors at the different geometries. And as I told you, this is done by computing the overlap of the wave function at two different geometries between different electronic states and solving the assignment problem. In this way, we can now look at what's going on once the geometries, 100, 200, few hundreds, are, um, are selected from the ground state Wigner distribution, and we can compute the shift 
in the spectrum from the reference geometry to the ensemble vibrational uh, to vibrational ensemble and you can see that all electronic transition have been redshifted by vibrational averaging by the zero point energy contribution basically we can do this also um, at higher at room temperature and you see the the shift the further shift of the spectrum to the red then we can put our molecule in our molecules in solution and compute the effect of the solvent on the on the spectrum the blue is the uh, most of the transition are actually blue shifted in solution because of this electrostatic interaction between the solute and the solvent some transition however are red shifted and these transitions are a pi pi star type transition and finally, we can also compute the effect of the rearrangement of the solute in solution. And this effect leaves the ordering of the state basically unchanged. Again, we have some of the transition that are transition that are blue shifted and some of them that are red shifted. The final results um, are here, are presented here. Uh, the black line is the experimental spectrum. The, the red one are the computa uh, computed spectra. And these lines here are the what is shown here by sticks are the mean excitation energy and the mean oscillator st strength of a transition. And each of these transition has a width that is given by the standard deviation from the mean of the excitation energy. We can now also um, analyze in more detail what's going on between different type of transitions. As I showed you before, the zero point energy contribution leads to a redshift of the spectrum. The temperature does also redshifts the spectrum, but to a less extent. And then the electrostatic contribution uh, leads to a blue shift of the transition. This is the main source of the blue shift of the transitions, electronic transition in solution. And structural rearrangement slightly redshift the spectrum. When you Combine the four separate um, contribution in a total shift, you can see that pi pi star state of all nucleobases here um, are redshifted, while n pi star state, n Rydberg, and pi Rydberg state are mostly blue shifted. And mostly the n Rydberg states are blue shifted. Okay. Uh, this red shift, this blue shift of the N Rydberg state is shown here. Um, what we show is the difference of the static dipole moment between the ground of, and the excited state. Basically, we sh show the magnitude of the vector of the difference of static dipole moments in a ground in an excited state. And this uh, magnitude is the largest for the N Rydberg state shown here, and then also for the pi Rydberg state shown in, in violet. Good. This about the first part um, on uh, assigning, assigning the UV absorption spectra. We did this using kind of diabetization procedure that is Na that naturally arise from dynamics because sampling of different geometries is almost as, I mean, it's it resembling sampling different excited state trajectories. We have the basic, uh, um, the toolkits that we use for the assignment of the spectra is the one that we use for simulating excited state dynamics and understanding underst um, excited state dynamics. So in my second part, I'll speak about dynamic approaches and make a comparison between different dynamic approaches um, and then look at the spectroscopic signals. The molecule I'm interested in is pyrazine. Uh, yesterday from the talk of Benjamin, you have seen that 
pyrazine is a very important in molecule in uh, photochemistry. It is a benchmark molecule and it has been known for a long time that the bright state, that is a B2U state, crosses very close to the frame content region with the dark state is the B and pi star state. However, uh, theoretical theory has shown that there is another state, an asymmetry state, also an n pi star state that is a dark state, is a B3U state that contributes to the dynamics. However, the spectroscopic signature of this state is still missing. So we don't know, we don't know for any, we don't know how to detect the state in a by spectroscopy. So what we have done, we have done wave packet propagation using MCTDH on a three state nine mode vibronic coupling Hamiltonian. Um, and we have compared the result with semi-classical trajectory surface hopping results. Then we have done also on the fly full dimensional simulation using surface hopping dynamics and two different algorithms, Tali surface hopping and Landau Zener surface hopping using ADC2 electronic structure method. And here the result. Uh, this is for the three state nine um, mod, uh, three state nine mod um, diabetic potential. Uh, what is shown um, is the diabetic population of the B to U of the bright state, the black is the quantum dynamics, the red and the green is the classical dynamics. And then um, we have done this also for the two dark state. And you can see the fast depopulation of the bright state. There are some recurrences here at 90 and 140 femtoseconds. And there is a coupling kind of dynamics uh, going on between the A and the B dark state. The agreement between the class, semi-classical uh, calculation and quantum simulation is quite good. If we look at the adiabatic population, then the picture is quite different. There is, a, there is not much going on. So the relevant picture is the one here shown by diabetic population. The problem is that on the fly simulation are performed in the adiabatic basins. And we need a technique for converting, for transfer, uh, transforming from the adiabatic populations to the diabatic populations uh, in surface hopping uh, calculation. And again, we use the same technique as for the assignment of the spectra. We, we base our um, transformation on the wave function overlap matrix. OK, uh, this slide shows the comparison between a uh, reduced dimensional model and four dimensional uh, dynamics. And you can see that both in the reduced dimensional model and in the full dimensionality, we have oscillations between the two dark states. They are not exactly in phase, but the same kind of oscillation can be can be seen in a full dimension in, in as in the reduced dimensionality. Okay, these are now our trajectories, and based on these trajectories, in particular this in, in, in full dimensionality, we are going to compute the spectroscopic signals. How to do it? Okay, we start from the ground state, excite the molecule with the pump pulse, evolve, probe the dynamics with the probe pulse, and monitor and compute the signal. To compute the signal, it is useful to divide the electronic states into three manifolds. The first one, the zero, contains only the ground electronic state. The, the first manic, uh, manifold, the so manifold one, contains all the electronic states where the dynamics is actually going on. And then there is a second manifold, uh, the manifold two, where the dynamics is probed. The way how to compute the spectrum is to start from the doorway window um, expression for the, for the transient absorption pump probe signal. Uh, 
the Hamiltonian matrix of the signal uh, of the system contains contains the three manifold. It is diagonal, so the ground state, the state, uh, the Hamiltonian of the on manifold one where the dynamics is going on, and the manifold two. And these manifolds are linked by the electronic transition dipole moment. So radiation uh, uh, um, by kind of. Um, but, but they are coupled by the laser pulse. The laser pulse um, here is the Hamiltonian for the for the field contains the upward and downward, upward and downward transition, and the system the density matrix operator uh, obey the Liouville equation. Okay, this is the dynamics, and then the signal is given in terms of third order uh, polarization function for given time delay t and this is the carrier frequency and envelope of the prop pulse in the doorway wigner representation that has been introduced by mokamel some 30 years ago the signal is given as a trace over the doorway operator the doorway operator um, d here d1 d0 and d1 are the one that create the hole in the ground state and the um, electron density in the manifold one. The field free, uh, the propagator of the field free uh, system and the window operators that detect the hole in the ground state, the electron density in manifold one and in manifold two. These equations are, these equations are well suited for as a starting point for the classical approximation in which the dynamics of the system will be um, the dynamics of the system will be approximated with classical trajectories uh, we, you can see here that we have three contributions the ground state bleaching contribution the uh, stimulated emission contribution and here the excited state absorption contribution in the classical approximation we lose the trace. The trace now is the integral over the phase space. The doorway and window operators are now functions in the phase space. And the density matrix is replaced by the Wigner distribution. Specifically, our operators, our functions now, uh, the doorway and the window function are given in terms of the Wigner distribution of the ground state, transition dipole moment between the ground and excited state, and the Fourier transform of the pump envelope. And for the wind of um, function, functions, this is the trans, uh, Fourier transform of the prop envelope. We have the evolution of the system that is given in a particular electronic state E that is time dependent is given, is described by classical trajectories. Okay, here are the results. These are the transit absorption pump probe uh, spectra of pyrazine that have been computed um, assuming a 5 femtosecond and a 10 femtosecond pump and probe pass. The total signal and the three contributions. You can see that the total signal is dominated by the ground state bleaching con uh, uh, contribution that is centered around 5 EV. This is the excitation energy to the bright B2U state. Then the stimulated emission, stimulated emission component decays within some 20 femtoseconds from the bright state and the, the recurrences that we have seen in the simulation around 90 and 150 femtosecond. But as we enter the manifold of dark states, there are, there are, and there are no other contribution to the stimulated emission part. And then there is an uh, excited state absorption part that has an interesting oscillatory behavior, but also in this part, we cannot distinguish between the contribution of the B and A dark state. So all together, in this in a transit absorption pump prop signals, we cannot uh, we cannot distinguish the two contributions. 
Okay, next we do another probe, another probing technique. And now instead of transit absorption pump probe spectra, we actually ionize the system and our manifold two is the manifold of the cationic states. The signal of time resolved spect in the time resolved spectroscopy, um, photoionization spectroscopy, the signal is computed as the uh, um, excited state absorption contribution to the uh, to the uh, transit absorption pump probe signal. It's just this contribution uh, of the tree. There is an experiment. The experiment is uh, uh, from the Suzuki group. And this experiment um, gives you uh, the map, um, the time dependence of the photoelectron kinetic energy and the asymmetry, um, asymmetry, asymmetry map. We would like to, uh, uh, to simulate this spectrum. And here are, here are the result, the experiment and this theory. And you see that there is a good match between theory and experiment. But not much we can understand from this. Why? Uh, the dynamics be, uh, the dynamics is, is complex. And the, uh, the initial, the three state of interest, and these are the bright state, the B and the A state, they, they correlate with different cationic state. The bright state correlate with the the first excited state of the cation and only this and only the bright state correlate with this state um, then uh, the two states that are of main interest uh, the red and the green state they correlate with the ground state of the cation and the uh, and different excited state of the cation we can decompose our signal in terms of diabatic states, where uh, one where the bright state give rise to only uh, to give rise to a band at around three eV that originates only from this state. This is this is the band I'm speaking about, and then the a the a and the b state give rise to, to uh, the A and the B state give rise to two different bands that are overlapping. The high energy band at around 4 EV and the low energy band. Um, I should say that the prop, uh, uh, prop uh, pulse frequency is around 9 EV and that even though the A and B state correlate with a different uh, cationic state, they are all the, the band are all here close to the threshold. Okay, so the computed spectrum, kind of broader, broader uh, computed spectrum that can be better uh, compared to the experiment, and you can see the disappearance of the uh, of the bright state, the contribution, the other two bands from which in which we cannot separate the contribution of the A and the B state. So why we cannot do this? Uh, to understand what's going on, we um, looked at the mean for the minimum of the S1 state. It should have been the minimum of the B3U state. But when going from the frank quantum geometry to the minimum of the S1 state, we actually find that this is not a single minimum, um, but four symmetrically equivalent minimum. And from the NTO uh, pairs, uh, you can see comparing the NTO uh, of the two dark state, you can see the particle one, you can see that the states, the minima are, cut, are actually a linear combination of the two. So these two states are strongly coupled. And the barrier between the different minima is very slow. Basically, our system evolves on a coupled AU, B, B3U potential energy surface. And that's why 
um, it cannot be, it's not, we are not able to distinguish it in the photoionization spectrum. The challenge in front of us is to, to detect a spectroscopic technique that can distinguish the two state and to compute the signal for this spectroscopic technique. The, the way how to do it is basically either to use a more energetic probe function, ionization probe, because then the A, uh, the B and the A state can correlate with different cationic state or and to increase the primary resolution. Uh, and this is to, in other words, we need to use two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy. Okay, in the summary of my work, I presented a procedure for assigning electronic spectra via wave function overlap. It is a, a diabetization diabetization ba uh, based technique that allows us to um, uh, disentangle the contribution of different uh, different contribution to the total solvent shift. And I show you how to compute the spectrum uh, without any empirical broadening parameter. For the pyrazine, the benchmark system, first in the first part, um, I showed how, uh, how the semi-classical trajectory compared with quantum dynamics, and then how to compute the spectra um, uh, the transit absorption pump probe and the time resolved photoelectron spectrum of the system. This work has been done uh, in collaboration with, actually, the work is part of the PhD thesis of Marin Sapner, that is now a postdoc in Prague, and part of a future PhD thesis of Thomas Lopitisha. Um, I also like to thank Aurora Ponzi for some from Roger Boschkovich for some benchmark calculation and from uh, and it won't be possible to present this work without the um, collaboration without with um, Wolfgang Domke and Maxim Gern from the signals and Pierre de Cleva for the photoionization part. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nadia, for this. Um very beautiful presentation so i remind you that you can ask your questions using the live question and answer panel so is there any question for nadia so maybe i will start uh, you mentioned that uh, it would be very interesting to to use a high energy probe high photon energy for the probe uh, is it something that uh, that is easy to do also for the theory i mean if you use a high energy probe you will have uh, to make sure that you include all the electrons that can be excited and so on. is it a limitation in your calculation the act active space that you can um, use um, so these calculations um, have been done in a kind of hybrid way. We use ADC2 trajectories, and these trajectories are always the same because they are uh, in the manifold one. But then uh, for the manifold two, you should take care, that if you use a high energy probe, to include all the, the states that are relevant in the manifold too. And in our case, in, for the, trans, uh, for the um, time resolved photoelectron uh, spectra, we have included seven cationic states. Of course, this is not enough if you have um, a higher energy probe. It is not a limitation in per se, per se but is a technical, technical problem how to do it. Um, um, we have computed the excitation energies, um, the ionization energies using um, Caspi T2, and then the active space is such that uh, we could compute accurately the seven lowest um, cationic states. How to do it if we want to have a high energy probe is, is a challenge. Um, but it's not, I think we can, we can manage to do it. Let's, let's do it in this way. There, there, there are ways how, how to do it, but the computations start to be very, um, um, very uh, expensive. Thank you. So there are several questions, one by Francesca. Um, so thank you, Nadia, for the nice talk. 
I may have missed it, but can you clarify the characteristics of the probe pulse using the calculations, the carrier wavelengths, the pulse duration? You mean for the uh, for the um, uh, for the simula simulation of the uh, time uh, result spectroscopy yes. or for the uh, for the as much as I remember the carrier frequency of the probe in the Suzuki experiment was um, 9.3 electron volt and uh, the the width of the pulse was uh, something like I think it, it was altogether 18 femtosecond. And this, uh, so if we look here, and this, um, um, uh, the prop, the, uh, the no of the pulse of the prop, uh, so the prop is 9.3 electron volt, the carrier frequency and the duration of the pulse is around, I think, 18 femtosecond, and they are included here in the expression for the um, window function. This is the one we use um, in the uh, photoelectron, uh, for the photoelectron spectrum. Okay, thank you. Another question by... Uh, so, so, sorry, one, one, uh, something else. So this is the spectrum that already includes uh, the, uh, the characteristic of the uh, prop pulse. So the other question by Sebastian May. Thank you for your nice presentation. Could you distinguish between A and B and pi star states of pyrazine uh, by using angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy? So can you distinguish the two states by using the angle? This is work in progress. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is working progress, uh, possibly, but. Uh, they are, they are the, I mean, the problem is that we can probably distinguish them in a very, very early time of the dynamics when they they are well separated. But then the system involves, as shown here, in this on this coupled su surface that is neither a, neither a, neither b, and you can see this from this uh, natural transition orbitals. It, it is really the dynamics on a coupled. Um, coupled surface. So I'm not sure, maybe, um, I'm not sure. It's working purpose. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question for Nadia? If not, we have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Nadia, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe now that the technical problem is solved. So now I think we can welcome Majed. So, Majid Chagui, who is going to talk about the fast dynamics of chemical systems probed by X-rays and optical pulses. So, okay, Majid, can you hear me? Yours. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry about the problems I had. It, despite the rehearsal, it got again here, and so I had to switch to another computer. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the ultra fast dynamics of chemical systems and uh, mostly, of course, molecular systems. And I thank uh, first uh, Francesca and the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, okay, so uh, over, the, over the years, uh, we've been studying different processes in, in molecules, mostly molecules in solution, uh, rather, you know, large molecules. Um, and uh, we've been using techniques um, basically uh, ultra-fast uh, transient absorption and, and fluorescence in, in the optical domain, but also, as you know, uh, in the X-ray domain uh, quite extensively. And uh, lately, we have also added, um, over the past few years, ultra-fast photoelectron spectroscopy of liquid solutions, uh, which I will dwell upon in the in the talk. So these are the different types of processes we, we have been looking at, uh, intramolecular charge transfer dynamics, uh, yet. They are full screened. I'm I'm in uh, presentation mode, right? Yeah. Okay. So share screen. Uh, okay. Is this working? 
Okay, I'm sorry about that. But could you see the previous one? Okay, it's not very important. It's only the introduction. Uh, so anyway, uh, I was saying we, we've been looking at different processes here. And, um, and these are not just purely academic uh, processes because they dwell on, on several applications. Uh, you have to know the energy balance in, in, in molecular systems uh, that drive other processes. For example, in photovoltaics with the famous uh, disensitized solar cells, um, sorry, um, or in magnetic data storage with, um, um, you know, the switching of uh, low spin to high spin molecules and also in photocatalysis. So, <clears throat> as I said, we've been looking at, uh, at this with a wide range of techniques and we came to some general conclusions about what's happening in, in systems, uh, in molecular systems, that we noticed that uh, in, in many of these studies, uh, intramolecular energy redistribution and internal conversion occurs at extremely short time scales. And what we believe here is that when you excite a system, you are mostly exciting high, high uh, frequency Franconian modes, which dump impulsively their energy to lower frequency ones, which often are not optically um, uh, visible. And, um, uh, and this leaves the molecule cold electronically, uh, at least in the lowest excited state, but uh, still hot vibrationally. And this is general to most of the transition metal complexes we've studied, but also to many organic uh, molecules. And it's been observed also by others. I'm only citing our literature, but this has been observed by many other people. The other point is, uh, and contrary to uh, traditional um, organic photochemistry, there is no so-called heavy atom rule in the ultra-fast intersystem crossings. A, we see extremely fast intersystem crossing events, few tens of femtoseconds, even for delta S equal two. And the second thing is um, there is no rule in the sense that the heavier the atom, the faster the intersystem crossing. This doesn't work this way. There are many other parameters coming into play, density of state and structural dynamics that play a very important role. But overall, what one can say is the Kasha-Vavilov rule that was uh, uh, stated uh, in the early 50s is very robust. And in this rule, as you know, in, in polyatomic molecules, wherever you excite, you end up in the lowest excited state that either undergoes fluorescence or phosphorescence or chemical reactions. And this seems to be very, very uh, strongly um, uh, the case, except for some uh, examples. And one I will show you now, um, where you do beat the Kasha rule. And these are usually, I noticed, uh, electron-driven uh, processes, so electron transfer uh, processes. And then uh, in relation to the Kasha rule, I will tell you about some of the X-ray studies uh, to uh, pinpoint the passage through conical intersections. So the first uh, example I'll tell you was done uh, with uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. We built uh, some years ago a setup uh, using high harmonic generation, um, producing pulses in the 10 to 100 EV region with typical few tens of uh, femtosecond pulse widths uh, to carry out photo emission and photoelectron studies. So we have, we have a beam line for liquid phase photoelectron spectroscopy. This is the one I will tell you about. And we have a set uh, 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 a beam line for time resolved, angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy of solids. And we used to have a, a gas phase machine, but this has been uh, dismantled. Uh, this setup is called Harmonium after a very nice Sicilian wine. I strongly recommend, but I'm not getting any royalties for making publicity for that. Okay, so the system we looked at was aqueous ferrioxalate. This is a very interesting molecule. It contains an atom and, and uh, an iron atom at the center with oxalate ligands, and it has a helical structure. And if you look at the absorption spectrum, you have in the um, in the in the red and near infrared uh, uh, the DD transitions within the metal atom, and then you have the strong blob. And that this was still debated is this uh, ligand to metal charge transfer or some some, uh, some other form of state but the exotic thing about this molecule is if you look at the at the uh, well first let me tell you about the photochemistry you excite the system in in the uv uh, this triggers the splitting of uh, co2 ligand first co2 ligand and it leaves the molecule the reduced molecule so this is now 
iron 2 plus into a very unstable state which after a while splits off another co2 but this time the co2 anion and this anion is going to uh, attack unphotolyzed molecules and again start the cycle all over again which means that this mo this is detailed here so you go from 3 plus to 2 plus and then you split off a co2 and then you split off a second co2 and that gives you know that entertains the cycle and so when you look at the photo uh, um, uh, quantum yield of the uh, uh, photo reaction um, it it's uh, it's above one so it's more than a hundred percent because you have the cyclic uh, uh, you know process where the co2 minus is going to attack other molecules so this molecule has become a very you know a standard in actinometry but already from the wavelength dependence of the um, photochemical yield uh, you see that this is violating the Kasha rule because in the Kasha rule everything should have come down to the lowest state and then you have the uh, whatever whatever happens to the system. That's not the case. So we've been interested in looking at this more specifically because there were still very important open questions. Uh, first is how fast is a reduction? If you look in the literature there is a no consensus. It goes from less than 140 femtoseconds to 150 picoseconds. How fast is the first dissociation of CO2? And again, no consensus, ranging from 140 femtoseconds to two picoseconds. And also about the splitting off of the second CO2 anion. This was again a very spread uh, uh, number. But there were some very fine studies done uh, recently by the group of Peter Feringer on uh, infrared uh, transient absorption studies that, sh that point to about 25 to 35% of the parent molecules recovering in about two picoseconds. And this was attributed to intramolecular relaxation. Now, uh, <clears throat> we looked at this problem specifically with photoelectron spectroscopy because we wanted to pinpoint the time scale of the uh, photoreduction. Um, and for that, uh, we use photoelectron spectroscopy of you know the solution under vacuum so you 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 need vacuum of course to detect the photoelectrons so that you have a a jet a, a microjet injected into vacuum uh, of the solution and um, you cross it with a pump and the probe pulse and you detect the photoelectrons and this is a picture of our uh, you know uh, nozzle and the catcher you need to catch the liquid and the entrance of the photoelectron uh, uh, sorry the time of flight uh, spectrometer um, this uh, technology was uh, refined by Van Venter, and he did a fantastic work at making this almost routine, but these experiments are far from trivial due to many uh, artifacts that one can get. Anyway, um, so we use this, uh, this technique, and uh, the reason is here uh, why it's uh, attractive is because uh, if you so this is a photoelectron spectrum of pure water in blue and this is with a ferrioxalate so the iron 3 plus ion and you see this uh, shoulder uh, which is due to the iron atom so you're really looking at the iron atom specifically um, now if you do a pump probe experiment you see that there is there are changes in this region and in fact changes towards lower binding energy i.e this is suggesting reduction um, and so if we integrate in this region and we look at the time profile, what we get is a, a, a sharp peak here, which is due to the laser assisted uh, photoelectric effect, which we had published a few uh, years ago for liquid, for, for liquids. Uh, this is basically the dressing of the, um, of the photoelectron by the, uh, by the photons. Uh, and it's very useful because it gives us a cross correlation of our experiment. And then you have this decay um, uh, uh, going on and then flattening at some point. So we can fit this uh, curve and uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the photo reduction takes place in less than 30 femto femtoseconds. Of course, it's probably taking place on much shorter time scales. If you subtract the LAPE contribution, the speak, uh, you look at the curve, what you see is that there is a first decay in about two picoseconds of um, the signal, and then it, it stays uh, dead flat. And this is about 25% decay. So this reminds us of the 25% uh, to 35% that were uh, reported um, by infrared transient absorption spectroscopy. And uh, that was attributed, as I said, to intramolecular relaxation. But that's uh, not, not e difficult to reconcile with the ultra-fast uh, photoreduction process. 
um, the, that would imply that you have a third, sub 30 femtosecond uh, channel and uh, a two picosecond channel uh, competing with it, which uh, amounts to 25%. It doesn't make sense. The X-ray, there were also X-ray transient absorption spectroscopy at the iron KH done that that concluded that the CO2 dissociation takes place in a in less than 140 femtoseconds, and they also reported a two to three uh, picosecond relaxation time, which they attributed to the uh, splitting off of the second anion, which doesn't also uh, make sense with the infrared uh, work because uh, here they could really pinpoint the uh, CO2 anion. Uh, time scale, and that takes about one nanosecond. So in order to reconcile all these results and hours, there's one parameter that the uh, people did not look into, and that is a solvent, the solvent effect. And I'm just, uh, you know, summarizing and cutting short of many explanations. What happens after for excit excitation, you have photoreduction, in less than 30 femtoseconds, I believe it would be uh, basically in attoseconds. You split off a CO2, um, in, in less than 140 femtoseconds at the yield of 100%. However, 25% uh, to 35% of these molecules recombine in about two picoseconds and the rest gets out and reacts with other unphotolyzed molecules. Of course, this is a very, very schematic way of representing the solvent. In reality, this is a helical molecule. And some years ago, we had simulated the structure of the solvent uh, shell the first shell around the uh, retinium trispiperidine, which looks very much the same. It's a helical molecule too. And you see that the water molecule come and intercalate between the ligands. So this two picosecond is not a recoil time. Of course, you can imagine a recoil would be much shorter, but it's some rearrangement of the solvent that allows a recombination of about 25% of the molecules. So this case is 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 uh, is a violation of the Kasha-Vavilov rule because electron transfer is really very fast, and actually I think we are talking about attoseconds. By the way, when when uh, when um, Francesca invited me, I told her, "Look, I don't do any attoseconds." She said, "It's it's fine." So the the examples I'm um, I'm giving you are are things pointing towards uh, uh, high temporal resolution studies that could be interesting to understand. And there are many cases where electron transfer triggers. Uh, we have another case with iron hexacyanide. Uh, electron transfer beats the kashava vilot rule. OK, so let's come back to the um, issue of the uh, intramolecular relaxation. And uh, some time ago, we, we proposed that for many of the complex molecules we have studied, you have uh, you have a, a kind of a, a channel through conical intersections that lead to the lowest electronic state. And as I said, electronic cooling takes place in extremely fast time scales. We would put uh, an upper limit of about 20 femtoseconds, but basically at sub-vibrational time scales of the high frequency modes. And then all this goes dumped into the low frequency ones, which are not always spectroscopically visible. So uh, this sim of, uh, of, of, of uh, conical intersection is, is uh, I mean, the, the conical intersection is a central issue in polyatomic um, you know, photophysics uh, and photochemistry. And um, it's basically, well, the point where you have uh, surfaces crossing and uh, this offers a channel for non-radiative relaxation. Uh, paradoxically, even though this is now the um, universally accepted concept for explaining molecular photophysics uh, in polyatomic molecules, um, the actual observation of conical intersection, as far as I can tell, has never been done. I mean, we don't, we cannot see. No, no one has seen the passage through a conical intersection, and there are different schemes that are being proposed. And I'm going to tell you about one, which we believe is. Uh, um, probably a, a very simple one, though not yet implemented. And um, and this uh, came up from uh, a collaboration with Albert Stolo and Michael Skerman in Ottawa, um, where they looked at the um, uh, simplest case of isomerization, the ethylene molecule. And um, after photo excitation of the molecule, it's known that uh, you, you, you undergo this isomerization. And one of the drives of this isomerization is a formation of, um, of a, a iron pair, uh, C plus, C minus, at the conical intersection. 
Um, so basically, you excite the pi pi star, it goes through the Rydberg uh, pi 3s, and it reaches a conical intersection with the ground state, and you have the isomerization. And the idea of this work was to translate the dynamics taking place in ethylene into signals for X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Here you have the simulated, uh, uh, so, so they took the dynamics and translated it into X-ray signals, but also into photoelectron signals, but I'm, I'm only going to show you the carbon K edge absorption. And you see here the comparison between the simulated spectrum and the experimental ground state spectrum and the agreement is, is really good. Um, knowing, you know, the difficulties of these calculations. So, so then the next step was to translate the dynamics into X-ray absorption signals. And uh, this is the dynamics over 140 femtoseconds. And these are the short time scales where you see, uh, and these are the binding, the, sorry, the energy of the, of the uh, signal. And uh, you see uh, lots of things happening at the very early times. By the way, um, uh, ethylene isomerizes in about 20 femtoseconds. So uh, things happen at extremely short time scales. Important here is to look at this figure, which gives you the edge or the uh, white line of the carbon uh, first in the ground state. So it's, this is this purple uh, line. And then uh, as you go to the uh, Rydberg and Pi Pi star, uh, transitions, you have the green and the um, uh, kind of bluish uh, trace, uh, and you see that you always have only one one line. But as you come to the point of the conical intersection, you have two lines. Why you have two lines is because you have formed a C plus C minus pair. So this is suggesting that we have a, a very direct way of looking at conical intersection, at least for ethylenic systems. Uh, and um, implementing this experiment is, however, not that trivial because uh, uh, you need to have a tunable uh, source of uh, um, X-ray uh, uh, light in the, at the carbon K edge. And um, it's possible at the Fermi free electron laser, although the scanning it would be uh, a point by point scanning. And the second difficulty is this is a, a gas phase sample. And anyway, we wouldn't try it on ethylene because the time scale is very short and you need eight EV photons. So we looked at alternative um, uh, ethylenic molecules um, and also uh, at an alternative approach, which would be to use um, um, X-ray emission because you see in X-ray absorption, uh, you have the, the, uh, the, the white line and then you have uh, all these uh, continuum uh, or quasi-continuous absorption. Now, if you form a C plus C minus pair, the C plus is going to be overlapped by the features of the C minus. So it can make things a bit tedious. So we thought, why don't we use extra emission? Uh, and paradoxically, to our great surprise, there was uh, no um, photo-induced X-ray emission of these molecules available in the literature. So uh, we embarked into studying them in collaboration with the team at uh, Eletra. Um, uh, where we excited the both resonantly, so at the at the white line, or non-resonantly around 310 eV here in the continuum um, to get the emission, and then the simulations were done by um, the group of uh, uh, Michael Odelius in, in Stockholm. And the idea was, okay, uh, we we do away with all these continua, and we just have the emission lines, which would help us in uh, pinpointing the C plus C minus pair better. Uh, so these are the emission spectra we got. So I'm not going to go too much into details. These are the uh, non-resonant emission spectra, and these are the resonant emission spectra. These are plotted as a function of energy, emission energy, but these are plotted as a function of shift compared to the excitation energy. And you, you can say this is like a, a Raman spectrum, an electronic Raman spectrum, or if you want a resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. The lines here are the simulations and the stick diagrams too of course, uh, and uh, you see that there is a very good agreement between uh, the experiment and, and the uh, simulated lines uh, and, and the simulations. And the remarkable thing is that um, um, these emission lines allow, I mean, thanks to the calculations, we could pinpoint which carbon atoms, especially for this molecule, aline, are responsible for which emission line. So you can really do a clean job for C ethylene. This is not useful because the two carbon atoms are equivalent. And for butadiene, this is a bit more tedious. 
However, in a pump probe experiment, and given that you form these C plus C minus pairs, we hope that we can really nail down uh, who, who, which which uh, which bond is isomerizing. This is um, uh, steady state for now. We haven't got yet um, time resolved experiments, and we hope to be doing them soon if we get the proposal uh, approved at PAL. Okay, uh, so. Um, there is one problem, though, when you are looking at light elements uh, and uh, you're using X-ray emission, and that is a core lifetime. In fact, this is a problem we, we were aware of already for X-ray absorption many, many years ago when we published this review paper that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the scattering event in X-ray absorption when you generate a photoelectron has to be much faster than the, uh, the, than the core whole lifetime. Uh, when you're doing X-ray emission, you have to be careful because now we, we, we're looking at light elements and the uh, cohort lifetime can be long. In fact, I was very surprised not to find um, uh, a clear uh, value for the cohort lifetime of carbon uh, <clears throat> at the K edge uh, in the literature. So if someone has a, a clue, uh, I would be quite, uh, quite interested. So one has to be careful about this uh, issue of cohort lifetime. Now, speaking of core lifetime, and I want now to, to go back to some practical applications of why extremely high temporal resolution would be interesting, even for you know common problems uh, of, of of you know uh, application of uh, photophysics. Uh, and I want to look at the uh, to to mention the 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 disensitized solar cells where you have a transition metal complex anchored onto the surface of uh, titanium dioxide, and you excite this guy and you get an electron injection. This electron injection by uh, different studies, uh, transient absorption, uh, and, and independent of the, of the, of the, uh, of the dye molecule, uh, here in the case of alizarine, and we did also work in my group on, on uh, ruthenium just by pyridine. This injection is taking place on extremely short time scales, and no one has yet uh, resolved it directly. And um, it's apparently, according to calculation, there is some hybridization of the orbitals between uh, the excited orbitals between the dye and the um, and the, um, and the and the substrate. Now, I want to mention an experiment which I like very much, which was a core level, steady state core level spectroscopy combining X-ray absorption and resonant photo emission, which was done in the early 2000s. It's not time resolved, but it, it really tells you uh, something exploiting the um, the uh, core whole lifetime. If you look at the absorption of, uh, of the ruthenium dye on TiO2, uh, well, you get this X-ray absorption spectrum. Now, <clears throat> If you do a resonant photo emission, so you excite one of the unoccupied orbitals here, and this electron, instead of, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, in, in, in absorption, it simply absorbs. You see it here. So this is a LUMO plus one and LUMO plus two. But in the case of a molecule anchored onto the surface of uh, a substrate like TiO2, this electron goes into the substrate. And so from the core whole lifetime, you can estimate the transfer time to sub three femtoseconds. So there's work there for attosecond guys. Okay, with this, the messages, intramolecular electronic relaxation is diabolically fast in these molecules. Um, intra and intermolecular charge transfer, so this, these last examples, uh, are triggers of rich photophysics and photochemistry, and I believe that they take place on attosecond to few femtosecond time scales. And then you have, um, we, we, we believe we have now uh, a way of uh, harnessing the passage or detecting the passage through the conical intersection via X-ray spectroscopy. And with this, uh, I'd like to thank those who did the, the work, um, uh, Thomas Barillo and Luca Longetti for the uh, ferry oxalate and uh, Rebecca Rebecca, where is it, Rebecca? Uh, yeah, Rebecca Ingle uh, and um, uh, with a team at Eletra for the um, uh, for the Etilinic systems. And I'd like to thank also the collaboration with Ottawa and Stockholm for this uh, Etilinic system and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Madrid, for this uh, very exciting uh, talk. So the session is open for questions. You can ask your questions the live question and answer panel. So is there any question for Majid? So one question from Nora Bera. 
very nice talk, Majed. Could you tell us how you plan to do the experiment on beta DN at the fill to catch the conical intersection? Well, I mean, the idea is simply to uh, try to to try to do an absorption experiment uh, by scanning the the carbon K edge. Now, this is feasible, as I said at Fermi. The issue is uh, they can do the scan on a point by point, um, um, uh, you know, procedure, which is not the best. Um, you know, uh, we we would like to. We have another proposal still pending approval at PAL. Um, carbon K edge is not easy to reach at PAL, uh, so we're going to go for the nitrogen K edge, and um, and it will be a different molecule. So it's not butadiene. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question for Majid? So I was w wondering when you do the, the liquid phase experiments, the solvent that you use, it, it's I guess it's not pure water. You put some salt or some... Yeah, yeah you have to use a salt, yeah. So does it... I mean, how much does it influence uh, the measurements that you that you perform? Because then you compare with experiments where basically people use very different solvents. Does it has does it have any influence on the time scale that you measure? No, the time we, we did not find any. And uh, honestly, when you are exciting these molecules, so by the way, the other works, the infrared and X-ray work, used also similar solutions okay. as us. And this was aqueous. Uh, with um, uh, salt, uh, and um, and basically the intramolecular relaxation is so fast that it's it's the main drive into what happens later, and, and the you know the solvent solvent plays on this two picosecond time scale mm -hmm. I showed, but it's not really and that's general by the way yeah? in all these molecules the intra process and actually also in quantum dots for example. The intra dot or intra particle process are, are the overwhelming ones, and then the solvent comes into play, contrary to what a lot of people think. Okay, any other question for Majid? No. So I also recommend the ammonium wine. It's very good. Oh, yes. Okay, you know it. I'm glad. And not many people know it. <laughs> Okay. So, okay. So, um, I guess we can move to the next talk. Thank you very much, Thank you. for the talk. Thank you. So, the next talk uh, will be given by Mark Oliver Wingart. So, we will talk about soft X ray absorption spectroscopy of aqueous solutions and gases using a tabletop femtosecond soft X ray source. So, please, Mark Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak in uh, this workshop uh, in place of my colleague Anno Rose. And uh, as in fact, I'm a postdoc working at the Max Born Institute in Berlin, where I'm uh, working for Eric Nibering and collaborating with Anno Rose on the topic of the soft X ray absorption spectroscopy, not only on tabletop setups, but only on, uh, also on large scale facilities. So on the next slide, I want to give an overview of what I want to discuss in this presentation. Um, so the topic will be soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy of liquid, uh, as, as long as considered the large-scale facility business, what we're doing. Um, and there we are trying to learn about acid-base chemistry. And the particular case I choose for this presentation is that we try to find out about the origin of photoacidity. Um, and the second part of my talk, I want to focus on our recent improvements we have with our tabletop harmonic source, and also want to demonstrate our first successful time resolved experiments we did. In this case, it's a gas based experiment. So, starting with the um, synchrotron based study, uh, this is part of uh, the ERC grant of uh, my supervisor, Eric Nibering. Um, where the topic is to provide a new perspective on acid-based chemistry with soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So our main working idea is that we want to have a um, chemical reaction, like this shown here, which can be triggered with a so-called photoacid. So a photoacid is a, a trigger which can be uh, UV by UV-induced um, excitation 
uh, release a proton in a solution, uh, which can end up on the solvent and also in later stage onto uh, other uh, base molecules which pick up the proton. So by this um, mechanism, you could uh, detect uh, by the using soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy electronic structural changes that follow the hydrogen bond formation of breakage. And uh, key questions that are discussed for decades is mechanism of proton transport, where I guess these proton hopping mechanisms are well known. And also directly related to that would be the question of what is the nature of hydrated proton species. And um, so sub actually absorption spectroscopy is a very good method and for studying uh, local hydrogen bonding geometry and hydrogen bond strength. So this can be readily seen by looking at the uh, steady states of X absorption spectra of water, where one can clearly distinguish the different uh, state of matter here with the characteristic pre-main and post-edge contributions, which tell a lot about the local hydrogen bonding environment. And for the case that I want to show in uh, this presentation, it's of particular um, importance to look at nitrogen containing molecules. So it is the, uh, here it's shown a, a study by our group on uh, ammonium versus ammonia, where you can see a, a significant main edge shift and also some pre-edge features, which are only accessible in the deprotonated form of the molecule. So before I come to the case that I want to present, I quickly want to introduce you to the experimental setup we're using. So this is done at Bessie here in Berlin. Um, we are using sub so X-ray pulses with a temporal uh, duration of around 50 picoseconds. Um, and the measurement is done in transmission on liquid samples. So on liquid sample and transmission, you have to uh, keep in mind that the sub so X-ray transmission uh, penet uh, is, is rather low, or penetration depth is rather low. We, uh, I will show a case where we work here in the water window on nitrogen KH. So we have to have targets which have a, a few micrometer thickness. This can be realized uh, by the liquid flat jet technology that was also partly pioneered uh, in our group, where we have two impinging single jets that can form uh, flat leaves, also with sub-micrometer thickness but with a width that allows you to um, successfully overlap pump and probe pulses. So with this, I want to switch to uh, the case that um, we studied. So coming back to this scheme of this photoreaction, we first decided to look at the trigger itself, so the photoacid. So how does a photoacid function? Typically, these molecules are contained of an aromatic core, and uh, they have a a heteroatom attached to this uh, aromatic core it can be oxygen or nitrogen containing uh, acidic group. And the functionality of this photoacid is uh, described with this first cycle type of diagram. So you have an acid base equilibrium in the ground state, which lies heavily on the acid side, so it's not deprotonating. And upon uh, a serious one excitation, this shifts strongly to the base side. So this is then excited acid form, it's a, it's a very strong acid. And with the first cycle, also some uh, spectroscopic observables like the transition frequency here can be readily um, linked to free energies and therefore also to the um, position of this equilibria, basically. While this has been used for decades, the question after the origin of for photoacidity on the yeah, microscopic molecular level, uh, what drives this deprotonation step has not been uh, fully resolved. So there is basically two ways of looking at this, which has been discussed, uh, and both deal with the picture that there has to be some intramolecular charge transfer upon photo excitation. So you could um, go with the um, picture just here described on the left side, that is, uh, you have some negative charge being transferred from the oxygen atom to the pi system upon photo excitation, which will then lead to a destabilization of this oxygen atom and weaken this hydrogen bond to the proton and eventually repel the proton. So this is the picture of the destabilization on the photoacid side. But if you go with the picture on the right side and you look at the deprotonated molecule, it has an excess negative charge here. So removing, uh, partially removing this charge into the pi system by um, charge transfer will in fact stabilize this space side. So in the end, uh, you end up with the same situation, the same delta G but the picture is uh, different. So the question is, which side is the, uh, is the main uh, charge transfer reaction happening? 
and this requires you to be uh, locally sensitive to charge density on this heteroatom. And this is, of course, a prime case for studying with soft X-ray spectroscopy or transient soft X-ray spectroscopy. So I want to show you which photoacid we choose for this experiment. This is the so-called APTS photoacid. It has a large uh, pi system here on this pyrene core. And attached to it is a nitrogen-containing uh, acid group. In this case, we uh, choose to have uh, the deuterated molecule uh, using deuteron instead of uh, hydrogen here, simply extends the time scale for this reaction. This is a, a quick check experiment by UV pump IR probe where we can benchmark the dynamics. And uh, so this is a reaction which now happens 130 picoseconds for this proton transfer step. And so it's more suitable for the 50 picosecond time resolution we have at Bessie. Now, what I want to show you on the following slide is that we have attempted to measure the electronic structure in both this ground state, acid, and base form, which you can independently generate by adjusting the pH value of your solution in the liquid jet, and also of the excited acid and base form. Starting uh, with the ground state spectra, on top is the acid form uh, sub X ray nitrogen cage absorption spectra, bottom is the base form of the molecule you can see two main differences. There is a shift of the main edge for the base form, and also there is a, a pre-edge resonance here. So this resembles what we already knew from the simpler amine amino experiment we did previously, and together with theory uh, by our co collaborators in Stockholm, uh, the Ordelius group, uh, we could rationalize this, that for the base form, we can actually access the pi star LUMO while it is not accessible uh, for the acid form. Therefore, this resonance is missing. So this can be also understood by some, uh, yeah, co this, this con concept of hybridization uh, in the acid form. And in a simple scheme, we have a sp3 hybridized uh, amino group, uh, which is pretty much decoupled from the pi system, uh, where the homolumo transition uh, happens. So there is basically uh, no way of accessing the LUMO from the uh, nitrogen one S core on the acid uh, side group. While for the base form, it's sp2 hybridized, and in the trigonal planar geometry, the uh, open uh, p orbital uh, can interact with the pi system, and this allows uh, us to access this transition uh, from the one S core to the pi star LUMO. This picture will also be important to keep in mind there now for the uh, interpretation of the transient spectra. Now we want to, want to uh, do spectroscopy of these excited states. Um, first, by starting with the acid form, exciting it. So we're doing a pi pi star transition um, in the UV range. And this is the transient difference spectra that we uh, generated. So the main effect here is, again, a main edge shift. And then also we observe two new features here in front. Um, we then did another experiment. We started with the uh, base form in the ground state and also did a photo excitation. So this will not uh, do any proton transfer reaction. It will just eventually luminesce back to the ground state. But what we can do like this, we can identify the contributions of the excited uh, base form. And indeed, we find the same two uh, pre-edge features here that we have identified also when starting from the ground state acid form. So our conclusion also with the help of theory um, where uh, the, the, the group I mentioned has uh, calculated the, the, the transitions that are relevant for this, is that we mainly see the excited base form here, characterized by these uh, transitions to the pi, uh, open to pi uh, homo. And the picture uh, stays the same. All the transitions for the acid form, as for the ground state, is the same for the excited state. They are just not uh, accessible due to the geometry, and we mostly see excitations uh, related to the base form. Now we're comparing the theory. We could identify that this S1 state, what, which was calculated, is the main state contributing to our soft X-ray spectra. And now to uh, gap, uh, go back to what, where, where we started with, the final result will be now to calculate a change in charge density for these states that we identified that contribute uh, to our uh, observed soft X-ray spectra. And if you now look um, for what is the driving force on the photoacid side, actually there is almost no change in charge density once one does this S0, S1 excitation at the nitrogen carrying group, which is also not much surprising because this group is largely decoupled from the pi system um, where the excitation happens, while for the um, acid side, uh, base side, sorry, there is a decrease in charge density, which is 
exactly the trend that has been pop, uh, postulated in literature, which will stabilize the baseline so that we could, in fact, identify the um, uh, charge transfer from the, ox uh, in this case, nitrogen atom to the pi system as a driving force for photoacidity. So this is uh, for the first part. I want to switch gears now and get uh, at least a factor a thousand times faster by going to our uh, efforts that we do with our water window HHG beam line, where we also ultimately aim for doing sub X ray absorption spectroscopy of liquids. Um, so we're using uh, 1.8 micron driver pulses to generate harmonics in a, a helium filled gas cell. And uh, focusing this into our sample chamber, we are using, or we, we also equipped with a liquid jet uh, setup here. Uh, where we also have a recycling pump attached so we can um, uh, recover sample out of the vacuum and pump it back in from top. This is important to work with uh, low sample amounts and of the, on the tens of milliliters. And in this um, first scheme of our setup, we use a VLS creating coupled to a phosphor screen for uh, detection of the soft X-rays. And on this part, we have had a recent improvement. Uh, we have exchanged our spectrometer to um, uh, two optic, so there is a cylindrical um, focusing mirror, and now a uh, reflective stone plate for uh, dispersion instead of the single um, um, uh, um, uh, VLS grating. And with that, uh, we have achieved a 30 time increase of photon numbers, um, so that we now have a 400 photons per million second at nitrogen KH, and we also could significantly. Um, increase the resolving power uh, of our spectrometer. On the right side, there is a, a few um, graphs showing the characterization. Uh, so the, the one contribution to the increased uh, photon numbers is that the reflective stone plate has an efficiency of around 12% at the nitrogen KH, whereas typical illustratings have an efficiency of 3%. So that's a factor four. And the, the remaining part, which gives this much stronger photon numbers here at nitrogen KH then uh, with our previous setup comes from the fact that the phosphor screen, of course, is a much uh, less efficient way of detecting the soft x-rays than our soft x-ray sensitive CCD camera. On the bottom, you see a fit where we determined uh, the resolving power with the fit to uh, spectrum of nitrogen. Uh, another um, picture here to show the improvement. Uh, this was a measurement done on, on calcium nitrate. Um, we did the same measurement here with our first uh, iteration of the setup at Bessie and with our latest iteration and here on the nitrogen KH spectrum, you can clearly see the improvement in terms of signal to noise by comparing the black curve that is our current uh, version of the spectrum uh, with the uh, lightish blue one that was our old version. So this setup now enabled us to go for uh, transient experiments, first starting in this case with a gas phase sample and what we did is we used our the same nozzle that we do use for the liquid jet experiments to pour in nitrogen gas with a quite high backing pressure. And we tried to do strong fit ionization with uh, on the order of 4 times 10 to 14 watt per square centimeter intense uh, 800 nanometer pulses. And then want to see the outcome of this uh, ionization with our soft X rays. Um, just to remind you of the uh, molecular orbitals of N2, which are, will be in the center of this upcoming uh, research and discussion. Uh, so for uh, ground state uh, molecular nitrogen, we have a sigma to uh, pi transition here. And uh, yeah, the other one will be relevant for what I will show in the following. So this is the result we got. So this is the, uh, the contour map shows the first 300 femtosecond after overlapping the strong field ionization pulse with the sub X-rays. Um, we mostly observed a very strong leach, of course, of our molecular nitrogen uh, transition, and then have these two more strong bands that are shown here, the X uh, and this one. And both of them, uh, we can easily identify by comparing to literature, they result from the single ionized N2 plus in the ground state. So now with the, in this open shell configuration, you have uh, the opportunity to excite into the pi uh, orbital as for the neutral nitrogen. And then you can also access now the lower lying sigma orbital here, which uh, corresponds to this transition. 
uh, of particular interest for us was also that we observed even lower lying transitions here um, to the left of this transition to the sigma orbital of the X state. And we can only uh, explain this, and also the numbers fit very well, to uh, transitions to even uh, excited states of our nitrogen cations, where we then um, tunnel ionize out of lower lying uh, orbitals, the HOMO minus one and HOMO minus two, resulting in the A and B state of nitrogen cations. And uh, so the overall picture um, is that we have done some strong field ionization leading to a distribution of ground and excited states of nitrogen cations, which we can map simultaneously with our broadband probe. Um, on, we not only um, limited ourselves to looking at the first a uh, couple of femtoseconds. Uh, first, want to also show the dynamics that we have observed here. So, uh, in very initial dynamics, we see some dip here, which can be rationalized by alignment of the molecules in the strong IR field. So, the transition dipole moment uh, for this uh, sigma two pi transition is perpendicular to the molecular axis, and upon alignment of our uh, parallelly polarized sub X ray and IR pulses, that this leads to this. Uh, uh, decrease in absorbance. Um, so this can be well uh, uh, modeled. What I wanted to say before is that we not only limit ourselves to the first 300 femtoseconds, but we also extended our study to tens of picoseconds. And uh, what we observed then is, is a clear decrease of our initially formed uh, nitrogen cations, and we see three new bands arising here. So on the top spectrum here, the red curve is the spectrum over the first 500 uh, femtoseconds, while the black one is the one averaged over a tenth of picoseconds. And uh, again, by comparing to literature, we could identify these contributions to come from nitrogen atoms in ground and excited state, as well as nitrogen cation. So that means our molecule has dissociated. Uh, the kinetic analysis here has been done with an SVD analysis. And uh, the whole uh, scheme that is uh, the whole uh, contour map can be basically plot with a very simple scheme of a single exponential decay and rise with a single time constant for the dissociation. So as you can see here, the, the dissociation of nitrogen cation and also the production of all the different uh, atoms in different excited states um, uh, occurs with a time constant of 20 picoseconds for this measurement at four bar backing pressure. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we observed the uh, uh, formation of excited atoms. Now, thinking about what is known of in literature, and there's of course a bunch of information about nitrogen, I just uh, picked the potential energy surfaces from this paper. Uh, we know that the lower excited, like the ground state and lower excited states of nitrogen cations, they are actually uh, quite stable and uh, they will not dissociate on picoseconds. And also, they will not, for this uh, X state, not dissociate to excited nitrogen atoms. So if you look at the dissociation asymptotes, we at least have to reach the L3 asymptote to produce the nitrogen in the T, um, 2D state, which we identified in our sub X-ray spectrum. So that means there has to be an additional step, an activation step to uh, break apart our nitrogen molecules. And uh, our preliminary analysis of this um, um, has, been, uh, has been supported by um, uh, pressure-dependent measurements, where we observe that the dissociation rate changes with pressure. So that means there has to be some collisions uh, leading to this uh, uh, fragmentation into atoms and atomic uh, ions. And uh, our analysis with the uh, kinetic energy distributions of the electrons that we expect and the cross-sections uh, lets us think that it's electron um, collisions with nitrogen cations, and the mechanism is mostly driven by this dissociative excitation of and to plus by the electrons. Uh, so with this, I want to uh, conclude and summarize what I have shown. So the first part of my talk, I was uh, discussing our soft X-ray spectroscopy efforts in liquids done at large-scale facilities. And the case I showed you was the, where we tried to uh, elucidate the origin of photoacidity of nitrogen-containing photoacid. And uh, the picture we got is that on the uh, protonated nitrogen group, there is, it's very much decoupled from the pi orbital system and therefore does not contribute much to the driving force of photoacidity, while there is a clear charge transfer on the base side of the system, 
which leads to reduced basicity of the base form, which uh, also means uh, increased acidity of the conjugate acid. In the second part of my talk, I showed you what we did in, uh, with our water window of APG um, theme line. And um, we had a recent in, uh, improvement which, uh, to, to this photo number and resolution, which uh, put us in the position to now do first gas phase experiments where we observed strong fit ionization of N2. And with the broadband probe, we could really map the whole uh, distribution of excited states that, that we initially uh, populate and also the, um, the, the photo product after dissociation. And uh, with this um, performance, we also um, are quite confident that we can now also reach our goal to do um, measurements in liquid phase, which is of course a bit more challenging, but we have the experience on the flat jet, and I think also the photo numbers now to proceed in that direction. With that, I also uh, want to point out that the work I have shown here is all like teamwork, and there has been significant contributions, um, especially by Sebastian Eckert for the study at Bessie, and also by Carlo Kleine, um, whose main PhD work uh, basically was what I showed on the um, second part with the AGHG setup. Uh, with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Oliver, for this very great talk and very exciting results. Um, the session is open for questions. Is there any question for Mark Oliver? You can ask your questions in your live question and answer panel. So maybe I, I will start. You mentioned that you, you use this flat jet configuration and you, you showed the, the dimension of the jet. Um, do you think that there is still room for improvements uh, about this uh, design of the jet? Would that be useful to have either thinner jet or larger, larger dimensions? Uh, or is it all already the optimum for this kind of experiment? Um, so the performance of this jet can be, I mean, the, the kind of jet with this two nozzle setup, uh, the, 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 the thickness and the dimension can be uh, tuned uh, by changing the flow rates that we are using there. And it really depends also on um, the, the solvent that you're flowing there. And also if you, uh, if you have high concentration of solutes, what we're doing recently, this also changes. Of course, there are also other approaches to this. Um, there are people now using some um, microfluidic chips to do uh, flat jet and also claim to get very thin jet with that. I don't have the experience with that yet. Uh, we will have the chance by the end of the year when we are doing some experiments at LCLS, we will experience this. And yeah, for now, for our experiments, this uh, configuration we're using there, uh, we can reach all the uh, jet uh, configurations that we need, basically. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Is there any question? Maybe I have another question. You mentioned the, the, the role, I mean, the N2 experiments, you mentioned the role of the electrons, so possible electron-induced dissociation. Does it mean that uh, you could observe a difference in the process when you change the uh, infrared intensity? Like if you, if you change basically the, the energy of the electrons that you produce in your plasma type of sample, would that influence uh, the, 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 the contribution of this electron-induced uh, uh, process? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, by changing the photomotive energy, uh, by changing intensity, also changing the wavelength of our ionization pulse, we uh, would uh, really expect to see changes in this uh, dissociation rates. Yeah. So we have done experiments at different intensities. Um, I didn't show them here. We didn't fully uh, quantitatively compare these. Um, but yeah, we can go uh, lower in intensity up to a point where the dissociation uh, really decreases in, in, in intensity. And uh, there are some experimental uh, issues um, uh, by heating up optics at different intensities and losing overlap and this kind of thing. It's like challenging experiment. Uh, um, where this is not so easy to compare one to one, at least for us right now. Um, yeah, but this dependence is really expected. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question for Mark Oliver? Okay.
Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much, Mark Oliver, for your presentation. And uh, this is the end of the session. So I will thank the three speakers today, you gave very, very exciting talks. And I uh, shall remind the audience that you can reach a discussion room uh, with each of the speakers by clicking the name of the speaker in, uh, uh, on the panel. And you can then discuss uh, individually with each speaker. And with this, I will thank you for your attention and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, so I guess...